Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of Improving Mental Health in America. Uh, tonight, we welcome an expert on teen health from Providence. Uh, but before we get started, I want to ask you to please share that link on your Facebook page so that we can get more parents to join us and talk about this very important topic of recognizing and helping treat um, teens' mental health in this country. Um, as a reminder, please, uh, after you share the link, um, I want to make sure you all understand that for everyone watching, that the information provided during this event is for educational purposes only. It is not intended, nor is it implied, to be a substitute for professional medical advice. The participant should always consult his or her healthcare provider to determine the appropriateness of the information for your own situation. And if you have any questions regarding a medical condition or a treatment plan, uh, please consult your own physician. Participating in this event uh, with this clinician does not create a physician-patient relationship. Please also post your specific questions here for Dr. Henderson, and we will aim to get them all, if not most of them, answered within 24 hours. Um, but please join and, and ask your questions as you see fit. So I want to introduce to you Dr. Robin Henderson. Welcome, Dr. Henderson. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Henderson, tell us a little bit about you. I am a licensed clinical psychologist here in the state of Oregon, and I am currently serving as the Chief Executive of Behavioral Health for Providence Medical here in the Oregon Providence region. I'm also the clinical liaison to the Providence St. Joseph Health System for the Wellbeing Trust, which is our new foundation that seeks to improve the mental health being of America. Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful foundation. We had our first edition uh, of this series, of this three-part series. Um, please make sure that you, all of you watching, uh, visit the wellbeingtrust.org site. It has incredible resources. Thank you for doing that, Dr. Henderson. You're welcome. I'm also the parent of two teenagers, so I feel like I'm kind of an expert in that arena. Just for the yes, two. <laughs> I can barely handle one myself, so <laughs> I, I'm admiring every parent that has more than one teen at home at this point. Yeah. Wonderful minds, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a really important topic, of course, um, um, you know, those of us in the thick of it with teens at home or teens just departed to college, um, their brains are absolutely fascinating and chaotic mm -hmm. and um, just ready to learn. And of course, as we discussed a little bit earlier, they think they know everything. <laughs> I know I did when I was a teen. I remember that. That's how awful I was. <laughs> um, but tell us a little bit about what do you see uh, as um, what are the most common sort of mental health struggles that teens face? I think the most common mental health struggles that teens face are, are the most common mental health struggles we all face. Anxiety and depression. Those two issues are the bulk of mental health concerns in our country today. And for teens, it gets even harder. There are a lot of new pressures for them that people in my generation, people even a generation after me, didn't face. All the issues related to social media and having all of your thoughts, feelings, foibles, mistakes, successes out there for the world to see nearly instantly in many cases. So I think anxiety, depression takes on almost a very different timbre for today's teens in a way that is probably a lot more stressful. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of hard. To, sorry about that. It, well, it's kind of hard to be off stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. It's all it's all amplified. The drama is amplified. You know, your private life is no longer private. And yeah, and, and you find that even though you talk to them about how public social media can be, they still post things that you think, why would you do that? <laughs> it's not quite 
um, you know, they, they, that doesn't all sync together. Um, and but you're right; it does get exacerbated by it. What are some of the symptoms that parents should be looking out for? You think? The biggest symptoms that I look for is a change from what's normal for kids, and we know what's normal for them. So when we start to see them behaving in a way that's not our expected normal, that's the first clue to start digging a little bit deeper. Are they uh, more, you know, less engaged? Are they more secretive? Are they hanging out in their room more and doing things that aren't normal routine? Uh, are they avoiding friends that you've known for years or even friends you've known for weeks and isolating? Is there a change in grades? Is there a change in comments you're getting from their school? But it's really that pattern of changes that you're looking for. Things like diet, exercise, um, engagement, even such things as sleep patterns are all good indicators. Look a little bit deeper to see what's going on. So that's usually where I recommend starting. So if we're worried that that some of those symptoms are manifesting themselves. What is your recommendation? What what should we do first? Um, when when you say dig deeper, um, you know, sitting down in the kitchen counter and saying, "Tell me what's going on," doesn't always work. <laughs> I know because I've tried. <laughs> That's true. You know, the best places to have converse are those that are most natural. And calling your child down to the counter to have that stern conversation, you know, sometimes that's the appropriate thing to do if they're missing on chores or have an issue with their grades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you want to have that more emotionally connected conversation, there are places that are a lot more natural, like the car when you're driving to school or driving to a music lesson or a sports event or, you know, before or after while you're preparing dinner or even if you can't get engagement at those points. Going in and sitting down before your teen goes to bed and just saying, hey, you know, I'm a little worried about you. What's going on? I'm seeing these changes. You know, I'm here for you. Can we chat? Uh -huh. One of the things my husband and I do is that sometimes we'll even switch it up. So if I'm not getting anywhere, I'm going to send him in to try it out. He can get somewhere. And that's always a good strategy if you have the benefit of having a partner that you're parenting with. Uh -huh. That's such great advice. I I always found that sort of bedtime time to be a little bit ideal um, in my case, you know, turn the lights out and just just before I go. So she wouldn't have to look at me. You know, I wouldn't you know, there wasn't that kind of light um, environment. And it was kind of like this opening for some conversation. But uh, I, I love your advice there. Um, That's so, a good time. Yeah, exactly. So I have a friend. Perfectly normal teen up until this point, um, you know, senior in high school, lots of anxiety, the SATs, the applications, um, you know, doing things like extracurricular, getting recommendations. You know, it's an incredible ordeal, um, I would call it, um, going through college. And, um, you know, kids, this, this, you would say this happens to teens that have been perfectly sort of going through you know, what people would say the normal course of life, wouldn't you? It can happen anytime, basically. Yeah, and there doesn't have to be like a precursor event. It could be as simple as changes that become overwhelming. Because here's what we know. Depression and anxiety are biologically based. It's not necessarily situational. For many of our teens and tweens, this can actually be a chemical change that's happening in their brain, and they may need to seek a little higher level of care than just that conversation with mom or dad or, you know, better appetite, more sleep, et cetera, et cetera. There's mm -hmm. times when it gets to be really overwhelming and then clinically you've got a different situation. So you got to kind of really keep an eye on things to say this mm -hmm. is what we call more situational, where I'm just overwhelmed with my SATs and college applications. And sometimes what can really be the best therapy of all is a day off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. So when should we encourage, um, you know, our teens to seek professional help? And how how do, would you recommend we actually do that? So, you know, we've exhausted some. We, we're still seeing some of these behavioral changes, uh, maybe, you know, eating issues, sleeping issues, those kinds of things. What would you recommend? So 
first and foremost, if your teen is talking about harming themselves or talking about wanting to live or expressing any form of suicidal ideation, it's always, always important to take them seriously. And that means at that point, the intervention becomes more parental and is more directed in terms of we're going to help somebody and get professional help. So taking that one off the table for just a second, let's talk about something a little bit less dramatic. Let's say your teen's not eating well, you're not sleeping well, um, you're seeing that the grades are going down, you've had the conversations, they're telling you everything's fine, but your gut says it's not. The best place to start is with your child's pediatrician. They're the ones who, generally speaking, know really well. And nowadays, many pediatricians' office have a behavioral health professional right there on site. Here in Oregon, we have a mandate where our teens are, are screened for anxiety and depression. They present for their yearly evaluation. And that tends to catch a lot of kids who may have depression that their parents and families aren't seeing. So it makes that yearly checkup with your pediatrician really important. We're all really mm -hmm. good at it when our kids are small, but we're not that great at adolescent well child visits. And part of the new curriculum that's supported by the you know, American you know, Academy of Pediatricians is really looking at how we do screening for depression and anxiety across those teenage years when kids are so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great advice. Um, how, how common would you say it is? I mean, for parents that are watching, how common would you say um, teen struggles are? It's going to be the same as the rest of average for mental illness. Probably about one out of every five teens is going to suffer mm -hmm. from some type of uh, emotional disorder at some point. And it could be just as simple as the blues or, or becoming overly anxious. It could be anxiety that leads to panic attacks or blues that lead to serious depression. Um, or it could also be those cases where you have somebody, especially in our older teens, who are beginning to have the signs of a more significant mental illness, something along the lines of bipolar disorder or early onset uh, schizophrenia. Uh, there are reasons that we have so many projects now focusing on that kind of 16 to 26 year old age period when we see a lot of that first break for our kids who have more complex and complex mental health. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I do, I do believe you're right on on pediatricians being such a great ally and a great place to start. Um, I was also speaking with someone recently about uh, teen life coaches, um, and that can also be great help sometimes. Just to you know start the conversation uh, in some other ways. Let's talk a little bit about uh, traumatic events. I. Um, I have, as I said, you know, I have a teen. She's she's a, a girl that wakes up singing, goes to sleep singing. And she's uh, I'm very grateful that uh, she's adapting really well to college, I believe. Nonetheless, um, recent events, uh, shootings in Las Vegas, um, mm -hmm. New York City, you know, recent um, terrorist attack, things like that, um, shootings and sadly too many of them. What, what are some of the ways that you think we can talk to them about these? Because it's not the same as, you know, little kids trying to explain. You ask exactly, you answer exactly what they're asking. But in the case of a teen, you can't really get that, right? You're, they're right. sent me a text and said, oh, my gosh, what's going on? You know, I'm so scared. Um, what is your advice? My advice is to engage in the conversation and to push the conversation if they don't bring it up because you know they're thinking about it. They hear the news, they're talking about it on social, they're thinking about it and they're talking about it. And making sure that they have credible information is very important. There's a lot of times that, you know, my husband always says the first report is always wrong. And that is the very first things that we often hear are gossip and innuendo and not necessarily what actually happened in a situation. And that can be very, very scary. A lot of times for teenagers, they need to process it through. They're going through some of those more, you know, experimenting with existential thoughts. And, and is this how the world is going to be? And they can blow it up into a larger issue, really, than what it is. Where they put these things, how they make sense of this stuff, is our job as parents and, and adults. And sometimes 
kids aren't going to talk to their parents about the, about these issues, but they may talk to somebody else's parent. You as a parent may be that parent for someone else's child. So these interactions we have with teenagers where they're talking through, what is my opinion in this space? What am I thinking in this space? And giving them the freedom to think through their opinions in a safe environment is really important. It also helps to ground them in the idea of some tangible things that they can do. For instance, after the Las Vegas shooting, some of the questions that I got was, you know, I like to go to concerts and now I'm scared. Well, this isn't a don't stop going to concerts. This becomes a conversation in how do you become aware enough of your surroundings so that if that were to happen, you would know how to get out. You would know, okay, much like when we get on an airplane, there's two exits over here and two exits over here, right? And having that kind of conversation to say, okay, in order to lower my own anxiety, I'm going to think through what I would need to do to be safe in this situation. Yeah, that's uh, that's great advice also. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but if you want to touch, I would love for you to touch a little bit on bullying. Um, and there's definitely so many concerned parents. Um, when When we started our blog about nine years ago, it was the issue to talk about. And sadly, you know, so many years later, it's still a prevalent issue. So how do we talk to teenagers about um, both, you know, the bully and being bullied um, in your advice? I think we have to talk early and often and conversation more than once. Bullying is a complex issue and it can happen in your school environment or it can happen online. And checking in with kids, especially when you go back to seeing those changes in behaviors, that can be something that's led off by bullying. That could be something where maybe a child in a social media environment in Snapchat and suddenly they're being bullied by their group and they don't know how to stop it and they're embarrassed and they don't want to talk about it. The biggest thing for kids to understand is they can't solve it alone and they can't solve it amongst their friends. You really need to get an adult involved to bring in some perspective and to, to put a stop to that as best they can. Now as adults, that puts a different responsibility on us. Much like we see the calls in the hashtag me too going on right now, we need to take a position that says, we believe you. We believe that you're being bullied and really investigate that. It's so tragic sometimes to read the stories of where, oh, we didn't see the signs, we investigated it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Start from a place of believing that that is occurring and go from there. Because whether the bullying is happening with this person or another person, there's something that's happening for that child that's making them feel bullied in that moment. There's really likely something there. Um, that's really our responsibility as adults, even as our children get to be teenagers. Now, if you have a child who is a bully, that's also somebody who's asking for help because it's somebody who feels that they need to attack another person in order to inflate and conflate their own self-worth, which means there's something going on for them too. So a lot of times when you see the situations where we'll look at a pair of bully, uh, you know, a bullying situation and go, you know, you need to apologize to this person over here. You need to do this over here. You can't lead with that stuff. You gotta lead with taking apart the situation and interviewing people separately, and figuring out what's going on underneath this. I had a situation a few years ago that I remember with my, my daughter was talking about how she had seen a bullying situation in one of her online games. And she and her friends had decided that what they were gonna do when someone was being bullied was to really kind of flood the zone with positive messaging. And they would go in when they saw somebody being bullied and they would flood the zone, even though they didn't know the people involved, with positive mes messaging to really try and change the conversation. Those are some of the big important things that kids themselves can volitionally do that will help reduce this. It, uh, you just showcased the importance of the bystander um, as well in a bullying situation, right? If you're observing something and you can step in safely, and you really should do it. And um, with that note, I really wanna thank you so much. You are so generous to share this 
with a national national audience. Um, I know you're based in Oregon. I'm I'm jealous of your patience that uh, I get to <laughs> talk to you directly and face to face. Um, but I do know that um, that you have uh, Providence St. Joseph Health. Uh, you have a lot of great initiatives for some telehealth help, and uh, that we will be bringing a lot of these tools into the awareness of, of all communities that are interested in these topics. In the meantime, I know this clip of this Facebook Live event will be watched repeatedly many, many times over. And I appreciate your time and, and staying late uh, here with us. Um, Dr. Henderson, any, any final words of wisdom for anxious parents? One of the best things for teens who are struggling is to talk to other teens. And there are teen lines across the country that have teens who are trained to listen in crisis, in distress, or just playing in those simple everyday school activities that they don't know how to solve. Things like Line for Life youth line program, the Teen Line program, our national programs that are out there and accessible. And I know you're going to put up some links to those, but really, there's somebody out there listening. And the biggest thing, biggest piece of advice is. When in doubt, talk to your kids. Thank you, great advice. Thank you everyone for joining us. Please feel free again to share this link to post your questions. And the good people at Providence St. Joseph Health are going to make sure that you get, you get an answer um, directly from Dr. Henderson and her team of experts uh, within the next 24 hours. So thank you again, Dr. Henderson. It was absolutely a pleasure to speak with you tonight. Thank you, Monica. I appreciated the opportunity and for doing this. Have a very good night, everyone, and you too. You've, uh, you've reached the end of your day, so um, I hope you don't have a long commute, do you? No, not too bad. It should be a nice short one tonight, uh, leaving late enough that hopefully the traffic's died down. But, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a good time to call my kids. Oh, great idea. Well, on that note, I will do the same. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, and have a very good night.